We are blessed. We, last time we had Jay, it's been about a year and a half. Uh, and if you don't get a prophetic word, a personal prophetic word, don't worry. We're getting a corporate prophetic word. He spoke one this morning, and it challenged my heart and applied to my life as well. So open your hearts, and let's welcome Dr. Jay LaRue. Would you come at this time? Isn't it nice to know our God's alive? Yeah. yeah. We just don't know how alive he is. <laughs> it's very. I want to welcome all our folks watching this live stream. Awesome. I, I show up in so many churches that do that now. Uh, YouTube things pull up with my grandchildren, and I'm like, Grandpa, look, you're on my phone. Grandpa, look, you're on my iPad. And I'll go like this. Oh, yeah. I don't know where that is. Sounds good, though. Um, yeah, if you weren't there this morning, please, if you get a chance, I don't know how they send the recording. I really, um, the word to the church, prophetic word, would be really good to hear, especially if you're a part or visiting or want to be a part of. I really wanted to do that then, and it'll be more personal this, uh, uh, this service with the pastors and, you know, and so on. And, of course, tonight as well, we have a little bit more time this morning and uh, a little bit more tonight. Um, a tremendous honor for me to be here. Uh, I love your pastors, his, their family, his family especially. I'm meeting the new young guy. He's quite the stud over there. Uh, yeah, man, I love him. I said, who's the guy on the left doing the video? He said, oh, yeah. I said, really? Oh, I can't wait to meet that guy. So that was great. And, uh, of course, that other pastor that came up here and put a shame to my preaching did pretty good himself, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, isn't it amazing? Don't you? It's worth it. You've got, you got a great team here, don't you? Just Yeah, the pastors are great. Yes, amazing. We're living in an incredible time. I can't say everything I want to say in this one meeting or in tonight's meeting, but I'm certainly going to speak to it tonight. But so much of what we've known has come to an end, and, and the Lord, by his ultimate intention, is bringing things to pass that we've been believing for. So I'm 42 years in Christianity now, and I've, in, my, in those earlier years, there were things I knew he wanted to do before I ever even read this. There were promises of God, and, and so many of us have been waiting for the Lord to do those things. But I want you to know, the wait's over, man. God is doing things unprecedented in our time. I just want to encourage you before I even begin, this is a day to, re, to once again, re-embrace the promise of God. Whether it came through a counsel, through the written word, the sure word of prophecy, a prophetic word, a dream, a vision. It's really time to go ahead and re-embrace it again. He's not angry. He's not mad. In fact, he's sitting at the edge of his throne just looking for a people that might be willing to believe him. And I think I'm with that people this morning. Yeah. I believe that. So please, for your, our own children, our grandchildren, for our nation, for our educational systems, the Lord is changing everything. Uh, his, his, his voice is going forth and it's causing things to be that only it can be. Again, tonight a little bit more on that. But this morning, I want to take us to a, a tremendous story and I want to say some things to us. It's one of those stories that, man, you know, I, I generally only do with young people. Um, I, I love the story myself and very seldom I've done it with adults, sometimes with group men, group, men groups and things like this, retreats, but uh, this morning, really, this is really the direction of the Lord, which for me is, is so good, to encourage us in, in the incredible ability of our God and what might happen if you and I would just believe him, no matter what we're facing, no matter what the odds may be against us. He's breaking the stalemate. Everything is changing. And this is the day dawning of a, of a worldwide church that the world has never seen before in their lifetime. Doesn't that just sound good? Yeah. I thought it was a fairy tale, a part of my life. It wasn't. 1 Samuel chapter 13. I want to read these verses, then pray, and then, if you don't mind, which I love doing, I just would love to take us uh, uh, directly into the story and, and just have us kind of live it out. If you've not been to this church, by the way, if you're, you're watching us by live stream, 
incredible building, incredible facility. You can't get through the door without 12 people saying, hi, how are you? Incredible coffee, tremendous teas, by the way, over to that side out in the foyer. Great, cl you should just come. <laughs> Chapter 13, verse 19. Now, there was no smith found throughout the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, unless the Hebrews make themselves swords and spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his shear, his coulter, his axe, and his mattox, their farming tools. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes to sharpen and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan except with Saul and Jonathan. They had swords, or it was found with them. Verse 23. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Mishmash. Let's pray. Father, again, I just thank you for the, which I consider a tremendous privilege to be here this morning. I'm honored to be a part of what you've done here, what you are doing, and what you continue to do. Thank you, Lord, for my relationship, especially with Pastor James, Jolene, the family for these years. Again, I, I couldn't be more privileged, couldn't be more honored. In this great city of Bakersfield, in this great state of California that was destined, as it already has, to affect the entire world. Father, I believe that. So this morning, Lord, let a strength come in us, a belief, an increase of faith, a, a, of incredible sight. Let us be in awe of your greatness, of your ability. I pray always, and again this morning, for the revelation of Jesus Christ to be all of ours. The revelation of the kingdom of God that has been freely given to us. It no longer suffers violence. It's ours. We don't have to buy it, pay for it. We don't have to be good to get it. It's ours. It's a kingdom that cannot be removed. It's the greatest kingdom on the face of the earth. It's a kingdom that has no limitations. You've given it to us. Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. It is the second year of King Saul's reign. He will reign 42 years. All 42 years of King Saul's reign, he will have war with the Philistines. They will gather this day in a place called Mishmash and Gibeah. King Saul will handpick 3,000 of the elite of his army. And he will gather them together and he will be on his way to Gibeah. It is amazing to me, as I begin to read the 13th chapter, I left much of this out, just I didn't want to read it all. As they follow King Saul, the army is literally trembling. They're so afraid of this Philistine army, which we'll see in just a moment. It's a large army. They were born for war, not just Goliath. This whole army was that way. They literally were trembling, the elite of the army. As they will be going, they will almost be so, so afraid that a portion of his army will defect to the Philistines. When I first read this, I thought, are you serious? I mean, a people who know the history of their God would literally move away from his people and turn and join the enemy. Some of them, of the 3,000, left, and they went over the Jordan to the land of Gad. Saul had only 600 of the 3,000 remaining. They came to a place called Gibeah. He was in Migron sitting under a pomegranate tree. He was in his tent. They would literally be hiding in caves and behind trees and in dugout graves that had not been used, uh, behind rocks, just trembling. It's an amazing moment in this stalemate. It was only 400 years earlier that this great army, saw, this great people saw a demonstration of God that's unprecedented. Under Moses, they would, the power of God would bring the, the Egyptians to their knees. And that would be a deliverance without a sword or a spear. They knew the history of their God. They knew his greatness. But yet here they were, frayed and trembling at this moment. The Philistines were an incredible army. They were Phoenician. They came to this, like this Gaza Strip as we know it now by ship. But they were born for war. I want you to see them. There were 3,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and their army infantry was numbered like the sands of the sea. It was a massive army. They feared no one, as we will later see in the life of Goliath. Born for war like the later Spartans would be. That's what they were raised. From their youth, they were raised for warfare. What the 
Philistines would do is they would choose a place like Mishmash. It was a flat plateau area. And they would send out what would be called spoilers. They were their elite. And they would always send them in three directions. They would send them to north and south and east. Generally, that's how they would go. In this particular time, they went, they went to north and south and eastward. And they were to come around and encircle Gibeah. That was how they began their warfare. Saul, King Saul and his small, fearful army had no idea that they had released these spoilers. It is these two, though, that I've come to talk about. This young man, Jonathan, who I love extremely. He's 19 years old. He has a younger armor bearer, and I love these armor bearers. They never have names like servants in the scriptures. You don't know who they are. They're just these special people that only he really knows. His younger armor bearer is probably 16, maybe 15 years old. They, they were posse, man. They, they hung out together. They went to the Christian school in Bakersfield. They were, they, they were in the youth group together. You know, they were still in it kind of, but Jonathan had to get out because he was 19, and he had to. Yeah, it's one of those things. I don't know why that is, but it is. Jonathan has one sword. His armor bearer has a small shield, not a full body shield. And Saul has another sword. Maybe that's a reason why the army of Israel should be nervous. Maybe that's why they were afraid. Maybe that's a reality. That there's real reason to fear. Jonathan is pacing. See, between Mishmash and Gibeah was this dried out wadi. And it had these granite cliffs that were like glass. That's why the Philistines chose Mishmash. And Jonathan just looked down at, to the Philistines. It was almost seven miles down this wadi. And he looked back at Gibeah, where his father was in the army. They had no idea that Jonathan was away from them. Just had his sword, and he was walking. Seized it and began to pace. Looked up, looked down. I love his armor bearer. He was just kind of with good King James language said, yo, yo, what's up? What's going on, dude? Jonathan says, I'm just thinking. It's just like this thing that's in me. It's like, it's just, well, his armor says, what is it? What is it? I got a question for you. Is there any restraint with our God? Man, I love the word. Is there any restraint? Is there anything he can't do? Is there anything impossible with our God? Does he have any restraint? I love his words. The armor bearer says back, got a little New York. No, man. You, you talking about our God? John said, yeah, our God. Our God, no restraint, man. They just gave fists to each other. That's what I was thinking. Jonathan started to pace a little bit more. He looked up at his father, tapped his sword. He was like, I have another question for you. Let me just ask you again now, just before I ask this now. No restraint, no restraint, no restraint, no restraint. Can do anything, can do anything. Nothing impossible, nothing impossible. That's exactly what I've been thinking. I mean, I love this young man. He's 19. It isn't about his age. It's about his spirit. It's not an age thing. So he begins to pace. He stops and he looks down. He says, here's what I want. I want to ask you another question. Armbar says, shoot, man. I want to hear what's in your heart. I love this young man. He said, so if there's no restraint with our God, Armbar says, then he could deliver by many or by few? I mean, the arm bearer says that. He goes, whatever's in your heart, let's go with God. So he starts to pace again. He gets to the edge of this dried out wadi. He says to his arm bearer, why not you and I? We'll go against this Philistine army. I mean... When I'm reading the story, i got to even step out now and go, this is amazing. I mean, who can believe like this? Let me say a couple of things about Jonathan that are amazing to me. You see, this young man right now should be angry with his father. Yeah, 
See, if you read this story earlier, Saul was waiting, King Saul was waiting for the prophet Samuel to come, and he began to get really nervous, and <coughs> before they went into war, they needed to sacrifice, and the people were starting to leave him, and, and he was getting anxious, and so he went ahead and put on the ephod. He offered the burnt offering, which is against Moses' law. You cannot do that. It's a priestly thing. The prophet Samuel comes out and goes, what have you done? And he said, well, I was nervous. The people were leaving. You, you delayed your coming. And he said to him, this day the Lord has taken the kingdom away from you and will give it to another. We know it's David. But can you imagine this? Jonathan was heir to the throne, heir to the kingdom. He was the next king, and his father's blunder has ruined his life. You would think Jonathan was mad at his father, but he wasn't. He didn't even think about that. He had something going on in his heart that outweighed that. It's amazing to me. Should have been angry and thought, you know what? My father's ruined my life. I, I'm out of it. Just, just, let's go. Let's get out of here. I don't even care about this. No, no, no. No, not this young man. He should have been angry with the people of God. Boy, I've known this experience myself. I mean, look at feeble, hiding. <laughs> The highest trained individuals, you're hiding and you're afraid? What kind of people are you? No, that wasn't in Jonathan's heart at all. He wasn't angry with the army of God. It didn't matter what everybody else was doing. She'd have been angry with God. Maybe you've known this, you know. I mean, I'm born now. Why well, couldn't I have been born later in Isaiah's time? Why couldn't I have been born in a better time? Why, how, why not the time of Joshua? Why do I got to be here? Why I got to be down, down this time? Why, I mean, why, why, do I, why am I here in a time of stalemate? The army's greater. Everything's fearful. Everything's dark. My father doesn't know what he's doing. The people of God are in trouble. Why now? He should be angry with God, but he wasn't. This young man had his heart set upon only what God was able to do. Nothing else matters. What a spirit. I believe the Lord without question, since I've been spending so much time with young people for these 40 years, he's already building it in the lives of our young people. Don't listen to the news. Don't listen to media. You do it once. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to our college campuses. He's changing everything. He's raising up a young generation. But it's not only in them. It's in every one of us. There's a fresh spirit of God that's, we're kind of thinking now, you know what? I don't know what's going on in our world. I don't know why I'm here sometimes. I don't know what's, my life is tough. But I know this. There is no restraint with our God. They begin this almost seven-mile trek. As they're going, Jonathan says to his armor bearer, yo, here's the plan. <laughs> Love this. When we get down there, when they see us, if they say to us, come on up here, then we'll know the Lord's delivered them to our hand. The armor bearer goes, that's sweet, Jonathan. I love that baby, yeah. Oh, but if they say to us, stay there, we'll come, I don't know. You know, again, when I'm in this story, I want to step on and go, huh? I mean, when did we start praying about this? Did you fast yesterday? I saw you eating breakfast this morning. You, you had it in your face. I mean, did you, I'm sorry, did I hear an angel? Did the heavens open up? Did Samuel send a letter? I mean, did, 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 what, was, was that, that's the plan? See, you know why I love this? Because I believe this. The Lord's already involved in what's going on in our lives. He's just at this time, who might be willing to believe? Who? Who? I believe I'm talking to the entire church full of them this morning. And those watching us. So they begin going down. It's sheer granite, like glass. The early morning sun is glistening. Off of, this, off of these rays, and he have, they have no idea, but the spoilers are on their way out here. They have no idea that they're being encircled right now. They have no idea about anything. They're ignorant except for one thing. Come on. Yeah. As they get closer, the Philistines, by the story, see some activity. They see 
Jonathan and his arm bearer, they think the Israelites are now coming out of their hiding places and the, the, this mishmash area begins to get nervous. They begin to scramble. And now the spoilers that have left look back and they see this going on. Even Saul's watchmen are saying there's something going on there. And, and it's just starting to squish. Everybody stops. The spoilers stop. And, and Jonathan get, and his armor bearer get to the end. And they say to them, come on up here. We'll show you a thing or two. So Jonathan and his armor bearer. They begin to climb. Now, I want to say something to us. It, this has helped me tremendously. You see, I was kind of raised, if God's in it, then it's going to just kind of be. Just no stress, no pressure, no trouble. And so as soon as pressure or trouble came, I thought, got to be the devil, got to be something else, got to be something No, 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 no. They had to climb on their hands and their knees. I really tried to forget the topography of the ground. I wanted to know how high it was. It's changed so much. Can you imagine? Here they are, the armor bearer behind them, with one sword on their hands and their knees, Philistines waiting to fight them. I mean, it, their hands had to get cut. It was like climbing on glass, their knees. But it didn't matter. Please listen. It doesn't matter how tough, how difficult. Don't measure it that God's in it or not. Just go for it. Just go for it. When they get to the top, there's going to be an incredible moment. There's going to be a number in here, and I love our Bible. And when a number comes, we don't live by it, but when it's in the story, you've got to pay attention to it. He's going to get up and he's going to kill, Jonathan's going to kill 20 Philistines. Now, that's going to be a huge number for us in the story and in the years we're living in. He kills 20 Philistines. All of a sudden, the earthquakes. It's a, such a quaking that they're literally all around there, all the way to where the, 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 the guys that, that had left, all the way to where they were, all these guys, everywhere they were, the, the spoilers are all starting to shake like this. And it's, they're so confused by the ground shaking that they, start, they don't know who the enemy is. They start killing each other. The watchmen of Saul look down and they say the people are melting away. They were slaughtering themselves. On top of it, the ones who defected all of a sudden begin to think, you know what? God's doing something. It was, a, by our Bible, a great quaking of God. Oh, by the way, I just saw so say, you know, because I'm in California. So I, when I go to uh, colleges that are, you know, that the professors don't believe like me and they say, are you Dr. J? And I don't you don't look like one. I know. And they say, you know, you believe that book? And I'm right, right, I gotta say, it's pretty impossible to believe. <laughs> you better believe it's impossible. You know, come on, three men go into a fire and they don't get burned. Who's good? That's ridiculous. I know. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> it is. It's, it's ridiculous. They don't get burned. I know, I know, it's ridiculous. Well, that's what I mean. And then there's that other guy. Yeah, I mean, the earth quakes for him. Come on, let's get real. And I said, by the way, do you know that the earth never quakes in that part of the year, that part, ever in that part of the year, and very seldom there? It's what our God does. He loves the impossible. Please listen. He shook the ground for two teenagers who would be willing to believe him. How much more will he do for us if you and I are willing to believe that there is no restraint with our God? They began slinging each other. The ones who defected started to fight Philistines. Even the ones who left got word of it and they returned. I want to say to you, watch it, especially in 220, in these next four years, this next decade. Watch the return of the people who have left the church because of fear, disgruntledness, because the Lord didn't promise it. He's not angry at them. He's bringing them back. Oh. The number 20. The number 20 is the number for divine anticipation or anticipation in the divine. It's there, I believe, to reveal to you and I what was really going on in the heart of Jonathan and his armor bearer, especially Jonathan. 
Here this young man is against all odds. There's a stalemate. The, the people of God, the church in the Old Testament, if you will, are, are stagnant. They're, they're stuck. They're fearful. They're afraid. And this army is overwhelming. Everything was against them. But this young man wasn't angry with father or brother or mother. He wasn't angry with his world. He wasn't angry with government. He was just knowing that this God, I can with divine anticipation believe him. I believe already that God's causing, he causes the divine anticipation to enter us. I'm not the only one. This I've shared with this generation for at least for this generation. But I believe he's causing it to be in us so that we would have an anticipation in the divine. This is going to be a year of it. 2020 is beautiful. I love it. We're in the 21st century. I know this, so please don't mind my numbers. I'm not that big into these things unless they're there. It's kind of fun. But it's 2020. It's double divine anticipation. But you put the two of them together, it's the number 40. And I want to encourage every parent, every grandfather, every grandmother in here, every father and mother in here, every brother, every sister, every sister. The number 40 isn't the time period of of testing, it's the end of it. It is the beginning of the inheritance. And God is beginning to bring the past, the things he has promised us, the things we've heard him say, the things that we've been praying for and believing for. This is a day of the Lord to believe him. He's causing everything to change around the world as I speak. If there was ever a day this, this morning to have a fresh anticipation in the divine, he's not angry with us. He's not upset with us. He's not disappointed us. Man, he's just been looking for a Jonathan. I believe, as, as I said earlier, that this spirit of Jonathan is not only in the young people, but he's working in all of our lives. My dad just turned 86 years old. I looked at my father. He's come to the things I've said. I said, Dad, this spirit of Jonathan's in you and I. It's in the sons and the fathers. It's not an age thing. There's something in us that God is causing. We got this thing now. What are you doing, Jay? I don't know about my world, but I know this, though. He is awesome. And there is no restraint with him. I love this young man, the armor bearer. And I'm going to be through here. When I first saw this story, I thought, I want an armor bearer. I've never been good with, well, I don't know, Jay. I don't know, Pastor Jay. I don't know, Dr. Jay. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I've had all Thomases around me. What do you think about that? I don't know. Can we go across the water? I don't know. Can we multiply bread? I don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know why I'm here. I'm a, a Thomas, would you just go somewhere else, please? <laughs> please. I, I love you, but... So, go. Is there another group you can hang out with somewhere? You know, and the Lord kind of dealt with me a little bit. Hey, hey, what's with the attitude? No attitude. I just thought, you know, he'd be better over there. But I want there's somebody around me like this young man. Not somebody that says, oh, Jay, do what you want. Cheat, lie, whatever you want to do. Oh, no, that, that's not a friend. It's not an armor bearer. That's no one. This young man, his words or whatever's in your heart, go with God. I'm with you. But I want them, but then I realize I need to be an armor bearer. The people like me, I, I'm, what a blessing, not only to this pastor, but to this church. So when I'm believing, it's like, Lord, do what you said you would do. Stir the hearts of my brothers and sisters at that great church in Bakersfield. Let, but, but, but Bakersfield, let us believe. Let us know for sure there's no restraint. I needed to be one. But maybe this morning we can make a decision before I switch this and move out here. Maybe this morning we let fathers go and we let the church world go. And we let any issues with our society and the world, let's just let it go. Let it, let's just release that. Let's get rid of that. Let's just let it go. And let us have an anticipation in the divine that we've never had before. Let us believe this morning that there's no restraint with our God. And let us become armor bearers to our person next to us, to him, to this leadership to our friends, our brothers. Let us stand by and say, listen, no matter what you're going through, let's go with God. No matter what you're facing, let's go with God. Yeah, I know that's going on, but let's go with God. I don't care what kind of army we're facing. With him, nothing is impossible. 
Stand with me, please. So glad you've joined us this morning. So appreciate that. It's a great church. One of the amazing things about this church is its family atmosphere. I mean, we talked about a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old, maybe even a 15-year-old, to the adults, young people, the incredible young people here. It's, it's, it's just phenomenal that God could be interested in all the generations. My, my grandson, my son, me, my dad, I'm going to have a great-grandchild later this year. I mean, it's incredible that he could be this passionate. It almost seems impossible, but this church is a reality of his passion for all the generations. I applaud them for that. Come and take, a part, take part of it. So this morning, if you need this, I want to just make one prayer, then we're going to say goodbye to those folks. You know, when I first saw this story, I just kind of passed over because I thought, Jonathan's a hero. Wow, one of a kind. But then as I read it more, I realized, no, not one of a kind. Just one man in his generation. So are we in ours. If the Lord would shake the earth for Jonathan, he'll shake it for us. It's already beginning. It's positive. It released the people of God. And it brought fear to their enemy. The enemy is afraid of what the Lord is doing. But if you this morning just need, you know what, David, Jay, just pray for strength that I will believe. I have to do it mostly on Monday. <laughs> Friday, I feel better. Monday's like. <laughs> Help. <clears throat> Anyone? <laughs> so if you just need the strength, let me just pray for the Lord's strength, fresh wind. Fresh spirit, the number 20, boom. We'll never look at this year the same. Every time you do 2020, that's right. I've got anticipation. In what? You? Nah. In me? In him? Oh. Yeah. Ready? Anyone beside me? I needed to. I'm not afraid of our world. He loves her. The hope is within his people, there's no question. So, Father, I'm asking this morning that by divine intervention, what only divinity can do, that you strengthen every one of us in our spirits. As you did with Jonathan that day, that there's an anticipation in the divine. There's a hope that surpasses any reality of hope. That we're fully persuaded. What you said you would do, yo, you'll do it. That's the word for us. Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. How about giving the Lord a hand for me? Hey, we hope that this message blessed you, and we would also love to hear from you. Please leave us a comment in the comment section below. And if you call BFA your home, we would love to ask if you would consider partnering with us financially. Malachi 3.10 says, Test me in this and see I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Hey, test the Lord in this and know that by your faithfulness, there is blessing and favor that enters in. You can give by texting any dollar amount to 84321. I want you to know that we're thanking God in advance for what he's going to do in your life and in our church. We'll see you next week. God bless.